Um, have you ever been building enterprise applications with Jakarta E or MicroProfile, or are you planning to do so in the near future? And do you want to know how to, uh, as, as efficiently as possible, build, run, and deploy these applications? Then this talk is for you. Uh, my name is Edwin Dirks, and in the next uh, kind of 45 minutes, I will give you all the guidelines and the pointers on how you can uh, uh, use Jakarta E and MicroProfile uh, to your advantage and gain the most out of them using these saucer stacks in your applications uh, and get and tailor them to your project's needs. But first, a little bit about myself. Uh, like I said, I'm at the Derks. I am a Java developer uh, a long time now. I started in 2007. Uh, I am now employed as a software architect at Ordina in the Netherlands. And I'm <clears throat> not just programming software, I'm also sharing knowledge and gathering knowledge because yeah, I, I like talking about software as much as I like building it. So I'm also contributing to Jakarta and MicroProfile uh, in the open source projects. And of course, I'm talking at conferences like this one. Um, if you ever need or want to reach out to me, I'm mostly active on Twitter. So you should definitely check me out there. Uh, and get the quickest response as possible. Well then, about this talk, um, this is not an introductory talk. It's more, uh, I kind of expect you to have or understand a little bit about enterprise development, uh, maybe have some uh, experience with Java E or Jakarta E or Spring, uh, understand the concept of uh, dependency injection. Uh, but if you don't have it, you should be able to follow along with this talk and maybe in the future, if you start uh, developing with these frameworks, then you can uh, apply the concepts I have been talking about later. So this is more, like I said, a talk about uh, concepts, guidelines, pointers to how to do stuff right, in my opinion. Uh, so there will be less codes, examples, and maybe some piece of configuration. So if you would like to have more uh, information about how to actually build and program with your custody and microprofile. There are a lot of other talks around that you can definitely check out and learn there on how the, <clears throat> uh, the, the frameworks in their programming model work. But first, let's start with a little bit of a background because I have been talking about getting the most out of your applications and optimizing, but what is it actually that we want to optimize, right? Um, so if you look at the timelines of where Jakarta started back in the day in the, uh, what was it, 1999 as Java EE uh, and J J2EE even, uh, and around that time Spring Framework as a kind of counterpart to Java EE also emerged. These frameworks acted on a demand for building enterprise applications, how to do certain stuff like generating HTML pages, accessing the database, uh, <clears throat> but not wanted to reinvent the wheel all the time, so standards were created, and that's how these frameworks started off. But you must know hardware and software development back in those, day, those days, uh, like 20 years ago, was different from now. And over the course of the, of, of the time, the, these frameworks had to adopt and uh, adapt to new ways of how we could do software development, and in particular enterprise development like now, uh, based on the change uh, in how much hardware costed and was available. Uh, and especially when clouds came, uh, came up at the, first, at the uh, end of the first decade, uh, these frameworks really had to, had to adapt to a more uh, scalable environment. So uh, we switched from configuration like XML to uh, using annotations to create more flexible web apps, uh, we created smaller runtimes, and more kind of status development became the, the norm. And so even such a big change that from the Spring community, uh, Spring Boot was invented, and from the Java E community, MicroProfile profile was invented to uh, yeah, adopt these new ways of uh, building enterprise uh, applications for the cloud. Now, if, if you look at now, uh, Java E has been uh, moved over to the Eclipse Foundation and rebranded as Jakarta EE. And from now on, we start developing new versions of this framework under this brand. 
But if you are a yeah, Java developer that has done a, a lot of Spring and Java E applications like I have, you might have noticed that over these all these years, development was different and felt different because more than 10 years ago, developing on my own machine took a way longer uh, because these were not as fast as uh, as today. And the, the frameworks application service that implements your CAR-TE, which I will talk about later, are not as fast as today. So you can really yeah, see the evolution in these frameworks that already optimized uh, until uh, today, but you can even go further with that. And I will tell you why. So over all these years, there have some perceptions. Uh, when you talk to developers, they sometimes think uh, Jakarta E is old. Like I said, it is like 20 years old. That's true, but is it really a problem? Uh, Jakarta E is slow. Based on my experience, for example, with the yeah, slower application servers back in the day, the perception is Jakarta E is slow. But essentially, Jakarta E is a set of compiled uh, Java interfaces and documentation. So how can that be slow? And also, Jakarta E consumes a lot of resources. Yeah, yeah, you might have heard about these big monolithic applications that consumed lots of gigabytes of RAM uh, that can still happen today, but especially back in the days. They might, might consume a lot of resources, but is that really a problem? Is it uh, compared to the Lotte carry uh, explainable, for example? And of course, Jakarta E cannot be used for building microservices. Big one. So is that still true today? I would say not really. Jakarta E is like, it's, it's old, but it's also feature rich. The ways we currently do enterprise development are still applicable with the, 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 yeah, the API, the programmer model that Jakarta E and MicroProfile provide. Um, it also has more optimized runtimes. The application servers from then are now optimized much faster. Uh, and uh, the way we now build microservices with MicroProfile uh, complementing Jakarta E uh, also makes up for that, that we can still build these applications for deployment in the cloud. So if you then talk about why should I optimize, how can I optimize straight out of the box, everything can work, right? You can start programming, you can deploy your app, you can, uh, you can run it. But there are kind of three levels that you can use to, to really get more benefit from just using the program model. Because for developers, they often focus at programming, developing uh, applications with these frameworks. But there's more to it than just that. Um, the reason uh, Jakarta E has multiple application service implementations uh, makes that you can build an app and deploy it on different application servers. You can choose a runtime that you want for your project, for example. You can also choose from uh, various different uh, build artifacts. Uh, I will tell you more later about what it is and why, but there's a certain way of packaging your, your app that you can uh, use to, to your advantage. But uh, talking about uh, application servers and, and runtimes, that means that, yeah, as a developer, you, you, you can program your business logic in with uh, uh, the, uh, Jakarta EE, but also you have to run it. And running it, that's where the perception of the consum consumption and the, the slowness comes from. It's not often not really clear how much of an influence Java itself has on running these applications. Why is that? I will tell you in a few minutes, but uh, there's more to it than it seems. And also when you can run your app, you also want to deploy it, of course. For example, a test environment or production environment. You also can use Jakarta EEs and MicroProfiles vision behind these frameworks to optimally deploy uh, these frameworks uh, to save time and stuff like that. Uh, and make use of the cloud native capabilities in order to make them fit in, uh, in all these environments that we have as, today, as of today. 
But first, when you want to start building <coughs> a Jakarta E application, know that currently we are on version 8. Uh, it is a byte level compatible with Java E8. Um, we are upgrading to Jakarta E9, which is kind of knocking at the door. It will be released hopefully in a few weeks. And then we have, with the framework, cleaned up some yeah, baggage that we have accumulated over the years to really set a new base for yeah, new features in the framework, which has been overdue for a few years. And on MicroProfile, uh, which is just like to cut a set of specifications that you can use to uh, yeah, build enterprise applications. Uh, we currently are on version 3.3 .3, and we are working on releasing 4.0. And on the base of that is a working group, just like Jakarta has under the ECAPS Foundation, to not only technical align with uh, Jakarta E, but also on a uh, formal level. Uh, then a quick uh, high level overview of how a Jakarta E application looks uh, to, to set the, the, the base. Um, we have Java, you can build with Java, Jakarta E applications, um, because it's also based on, on Java, of course. Um, <clears throat> and you, when, when you build it with, for example, Maven, you can create a jar, Java archive, an enterprise archive, or a web archive. Uh, but that is, yeah, your, your app built, but it doesn't run. It is a, yeah, th that thing that you need to put into context to really uh, make it work. And that's where Java, uh, the JRE come in, comes in because the JRE of Java contains a JVM. And that is actually the thing that runs your Java app saying you have to run an application server, which is essentially also a Java app and then deploy your build app on that application server. So this means that you have a, your app separate from your application server and you can then like I already said, mix and match with which application server suits you best. And the reason why this all works is that both your uh, application and the application server are implemented the same uh, framework, Jakarta E and or MicroProfile. And that's how they fit on each other and <clears throat> seamlessly so that you can uh, yeah, keep them separate. But when you start a project with, uh, um, with Jakarta E with Maven, uh, and you could compare that to Spring, uh, here you already can uh, see some yeah, potential benefits of using uh, Jakarta E's uh, approach. Because if you define a new project for Jakarta, you only need uh, one uh, dependency, like I've shown here. And if you want to use MicroProfile in addition, you will need the second dependency. But that's all because this dependency provides you with everything in the whole framework have access to every, every specification, every feature. And if you don't use something, you're not dragging it along. It's just not taken into account. So that makes up for very easy starting of a project because you'll only need this. Comparing on to how that is done in Spring, uh, you have to yeah, find the components because Spring is a component-based framework. You have to find the component that you need and that work with each other and you have to really think about the, the, the setup of your project. Of course, you can always end, uh, add and remove components and when you're upgrading your app, replace these components. But it's all work that you don't have to do with the Jakarta approach because there's everything implicitly available for you. So I'm also not yeah, daily creating new projects, but I find the spring approach more tedious than uh, the neat approach Jakarta uses in this in this regard. Then with Maven, you can also build your application, like I already said, uh, and then you can yeah, kind of choose a different, uh, a specific packaging type uh, that has some uh, pros and cons depending on what they uh, contain. Like uh, starting here, the in the left, uh, the upper upper left, when you yeah, use the the full vision of Jakarta E, the microprofile, your your application is as small as possible, 
because the application server should contain everything that is needed to run the application that shouldn't be shipped with your app itself. So that means with a thin bar only containing possible configuration, but also only your code that has been compiled. And this should relatively result in only a few kilobytes of your logic because it's just your compiled Java classes. If you look how it's done at the Spring Framework, for example, uh, if you have all these, these dependencies, uh, you have your code, and this is all compiled and taken into one yeah, set or is the thin bar, but then added with, uh, in are all the Spring dependencies that you need to run the Spring Framework on, for example, Tomcat as a server container. So that is an application server that doesn't provide all the means to run the app. A lot of these means is shipped with the app itself in the fed war. Yeah, so your code along with the Spring Framework. And then there's a third option. That's the Uber or fed jar. Um, very famous from the Spring Boot uh, community that kind of came up with it, with the concept. And that is everything, your application server configuration and your code in one, uh, one, one artifact, one jar. Uh, why, if, why if I put it in the middle? Well, there are means uh, within the Java Jakarta e, uh, community to also create Google jars, <laughs> even though it kind of contradicts the way uh, uh, these applications should be built uh, as a bit of thin bar. But I will explain later why that is and how you can uh, use that. And there's a fourth option that's kind of a new kit on the block. It's a skim jar that contains your application logic and a small runner. And what that runner is, I will also explain later in this talk. But I will go over these options and explain what uh, each of them encompasses and what the pros and cons are. Well, because one thing that is often overlooked when you uh, yeah, create one of these artifacts uh, with a thin wire skim jar, are, yeah, supposing that, that you uh, program securely, of course, cannot contain any security threats because there is nothing in it other than your code. But with a FET var and Uber jar that are generated after you have compiled your, uh, your app, because then your artifacts are being built, all these dependencies are being put in. If you look at uh, these uh, Twitter quotes from one of the experts in our field, uh, for a simple Spring application, you drag in a lot of jars, a lot of class files, and a lot of lines of code for a simple hello world. And uh, someone uh, uh, commented on that. He said, oh, you even dra drag in some CVE vulnerabilities. So that makes your app kind of unsafe after you have built it. And if you don't know that, then yeah, you can potentially uh, harm your uh, application when, put you, when you put it in production because it could have uh, could be exposing a uh, severe security threat. How can you mitigate this with the thin wire and skim jar? I will tell you later when we talk about the application concept in more detail. But if you didn't know that this can be a result of using either of these frameworks, uh, now you know. So now we have seen how we can build our Jakarta E applications and microprofile uh, compared to Spring. <clears throat> now let's see how we can efficiently run them. And there are kind of four ways. Uh, they, they almost match with the, the packaging types, but I will explain why that is and why that is not. But uh, you can see here the whole jar is, uh, is new and the application server is also uh, uh, new for, uh, for running. Um, let's start with the application server first. Uh, I have dragged, drawn here a, uh, yeah, a box that represents a Jakarta E or microprofile compatible application server. By Jakarta E and microprofile, and this is where they complement each other. The specification set from Jakarta is much similar like the one uh, for microprofile. And the, when you put them together in an application server, they, they complement each other. They don't crash, or clash, or overlap each other. So they, that's why you can get application servers that are either Jakarta E based or microprofile based, which can, the most of them are nowadays supporting both. 
So that means that you can use both frameworks in one app, and one, like I have shown in the in the in the Maven configuration, but also in the application server. Like this, that's the only thing you need. And with that, you can build then a UR web archive that contains your app or an enterprise archive that contains multiple of these on a single application server. And you can run this, of course, uh, with a specific supporting version of Java. It not only has to, of course, be compatible with the application server, but also with, your, with the app that you deploy on it. But if you really look at an application server itself, what, what do we really have? Well, you can download, I think uh, every application server as a open source project, a zip file that contains a lot of other files, libraries, configuration files, text files, licenses, you name it, everything is in there. And you, when you extract that zip file, that is your application server, essentially. It's yeah, a whole lot of files, and it doesn't do anything unless you run it with Java. Then your application server, which is essentially a Java program, uh, comes to life. And then you can deploy your application on it. But it also means that this is what you see and what you get. There is nothing dragged in before or after based on your app's build. So if that app fits on the application server, you can ship that and place that, and it will be there even if you uh, change the app, you don't necessarily have to change the application server, of course. But the other way around for developer and uh, maintainers of that are, is, much, is much more interesting because this application server is made by a vendor responsible for that, shipping it as a product. So the vendor is the one that knows the application server best. So if there's one, something wrong with it, you can, as the, uh, of course, as a developer in an open source project, before, provide a patch yourself, but the vendor also should be able to provide a patch, right? So let the application server vendor update the server so it will be better uh, and you can uh, benefit from that. You, that prevents you as a developer from having to fix the internals of the application server. Uh, that also means that if you get a patch, you can easily apply it to the application server um, without having to read, compile your app. Uh, so you can just take your app, put it on a new version of the application server, and it will probably run fine again. Um, and uh, yeah, enables portability for thin and fat wars. Uh, both should fit on the application server, but the thin wire in its ultimate form would contain no dependencies, only the logic that is being run by the application server. The, the fatter your war gets, and more dependencies are in your, uh, in your war that you deploy there, not only have you to ship more megabytes because the war is bigger, but the chance becomes bigger that it contains something on the class path in these dependencies that can clash with what the application server provides. So you really have to be thoughtful for that where you have an uh, app that has some dependencies in it. We have to make sure that it doesn't clash with the application server's internals on the cost path, for example. Now, how can you find a compatible application server? Now, well, luckily, there's nowadays a one single page of truth, source of truth uh, that you can find on the internet, as I've shown here that shows the application servers that you can download as an open source project that are compatible with your KTE and or microprofile. So if you want to build an app and you want to test out which application server uh, you have the most comf uh, comfortable with or uh, contains a commercial feature that you would like, you can try it out uh, by just yeah, switching application servers and uh, look for the one uh, that, that, that fits your situation best. Sorry. I think I'm missing a slide here, but okay. Um, I am using, uh, I, have, I have been using uh, the Payar application server lately. I will uh, use this one for a few examples to illustrate the, the, the possibilities of this server. Um, we also have uh, the, the Payar server mentioned here as a full compatible application server. 
So like I already said, you can download it as such. Papiara also supplies a uh, micro variant of that application server, which is shown here. So this, this, this more compact application server is shipped as a single jar and not as a zip file that you have to extract and you can get all these, these, these files. This is one thing that you download and, and ship as such. Because uh, we can also, uh, 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 in this case, uh, determine that it also uh, is compatible with MicroProfile and Jakarta E. So we can deploy the same app we can deploy on the application server also on the uh, Piara Micro version and run it with a supporting version of Java. But in this instance, you run the jar, not the application server. And as a parameter, you supply the location of the wire that is being deployed on it. But again, what do we have now? Well, we have now our application server just stripped down to kind of essentially only supporting MicroProfile and Jakarta E with possibly some uh, commercial features that are added as a vendor, but it should be able to run every uh, MicroProfile and Jakarta E application. Why do they? Uh, why have they invented this uh, this 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 server? Well, the application server can of course run in a scalable environment, but it's much bigger in in size than uh, this slimmed down version by Micro. This one is more tuned to, yeah, be deployed in an environment where you are, you are un unlikely to log into the server and try to fix it if it is unhealthy. This is more the case with traditional uh, application server use. So there is no need or kind of no need for application uh, server uh, monitoring and stuff like that. Um, your environment will just shut down the Piara microserver is does, if it doesn't uh, run healthy and spin up a new one. So this is one of the, 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 the things that are done to adopt new ways and cloud native ways of building enterprise applications. Then we have the Uber jar also, yeah, assumed compatible with MicroProfile and Jakarta. Now we also built a, a jar with Maven. So bytecode that you have programmed is put in there, but also the application server <clears throat> in this instance, for example, Payara Micro. So this is now not a, uh, a war and a jar separated anymore. This is just one jar, much like it is for Spring Boot. And this can, you can run with a compatible version of Java. Again, what do we have? Kind of the same thing as the uh, hollow jar, of course, um, but you can now just ship it as one artifact. So just using Java minus jar, and then, then uh, this, this, yeah, the location of this jar, it will run. And this is the most simple way to yeah, put your app in a container, as we will show you see later. But it's also the most cumbersome in terms of megabytes because every time you need to change your app, you have to rebuild it, recompile it, and uh, everything needs to be uh, done uh, again. You cannot ship the application server and the code uh, loosely coupled anymore. And then last, last but, not, but not least, we have the skimmed jar. It's kind of a new concept. We assume for now also compat yeah, compatibility or support for MicroProfile and Jakarta. Again, with Maven, a jar is being built. The bytecode is put into it along with the runner. And this concept is being applied by Quarkus, one of the newer frameworks uh, in our field. So where do you uh, put the application server internals then? then? Because there is no application server in, uh, yeah, in, in, in Quarkus. You have this set of libraries that you build with uh, yeah, the, the components you want to use with Quarkus. So this is much like the Spring Boot approach. You define the components you need. They are used, being used to uh, run the app that you built for this set of, uh, of libs. And also, of course, run by a, a compatible version of Java. So that doesn't change. 
But now we can see that, that, that we really have a new framework, Quarkus, and it supports the old MicroProfile and Jakarta E and even Spring programming models. The, the, the key takeaway from this is that uh, it is very valuable to know how to do Spring, MicroProfile and Jakarta EE development. Even if you say it is old, it's it feature rich because it's still applied and it's still applicable because these programming models are available on new, new yeah, ways of building enterprise development, uh, enterprise applications with, for example, Quarkus. Yeah, the, the program model doesn't define how it's running and being built and shipped. And that's the beauty of it. But then we have chosen a application server or uh, appointment type or combined with uh, the skimmed or uh, Uber jar. Like I said earlier, don't underestimate the power of Java in running these applications in regards of speed, uh, resource consumption and uh, stability. Because you have the option in Java and especially now with all these uh, open, especially, especially now it is an open source project, you can ship it with different JVMs. So if you have Java 8, um, you might be comfortable and uh, uh, familiar with Oracle's version of that, the hotspot JVM. But maybe you didn't know that you can also get the same JDK, but then packaged with an OpenG9 JVM, for example. A whole different thing, but also implementing the JVM specification that it can run as a normal Java JVM. And that, if you, if you see this, uh, a uh, screenshot already results in just running an app with two different JVMs. One uses the hotspot JVM and the other uses OpenJ9. You see in this instance that uh, the OpenJ9 cons consumes less memory in this instance. It doesn't have to be altered, always that like that, that you have to uh, see for yourself. But just to illustrate that simply choosing a new JVM can result in different behavior and or consumption of your app running. And also, if you think from the outside, oh, my app is running fine, it doesn't crash, it runs smoothly. If you put something like Visual uh, VM as a profiler or the flight recorder from Java on it, you can see, well, why is my uh, CPU usage so erratic? Why is my memory so high? And why is it garbage collecting like that? This is looking into your app when you think, yeah, should I do that? Because you can do something with these statistics, of course. And like I said, your app can run like you want it to run, perceived from the outside, but from the inside, you might be able to optimize it by just using a different garbage collector for Java, for example, or tuning the memory properties or one of the other uh, abundant amount of properties that you can use to tune your JVM. But also you can, in uh, complementary to tuning Java, you can also tune your application server running Java. Um, I have illustrated here an experiment that I did uh, with Payara Micro on the hotspot JVM, who complete out of the box. It started in seven seconds, like you see here on the top. Um, then I tried uh, to run it with an OpenJ9 JVM and some standard tuning of preparing classes. And then it started at two and a half seconds. So I was like, wow, there's almost uh, five seconds shaved off of the starting up the same application server. But then I started to uh, deploy a simple app on it in a Jakarta E application. And you see with the hotspot uh, setup, it already went to 10 or almost 11 seconds even. Uh, the startup. And with the OpenJ9 approach, it was almost five. Th this is just running on my machine, of course, but I hope these, these figures illustrate that when you start tuning your application server in combination with Java itself, you can benefit from it in regards to, for example, memory consumption, CPU usage, and startup time. Then is changing a uh, JVM hard to do? Uh, I don't think so. It's downloading a, J, a, a JDK with a specific 
uh, uh, JVM, like you can do from uh, .openjdk.net. Very simple. And when you want to yeah, run your app on two different uh, JVMs, you can switch to Java Home for that applications, and then you can already uh, see how they run next to each other. So that shouldn't be too hard to do, and uh, it's very low hanging fruit to, to at least start off it and see how your app behaves. But why would you really do that? Uh, because there's one thing very true right now, and that is memory in scalable environments like clouds is very expensive. So the less memory you have to use running or scaling your app in a scalable environment like Kubernetes, that is money saved with just, for example, using a different JVM. So that can be really beneficial for you or the company that you work for, of course. Also, for startup time, you can, as development teams, shave some time of development because yeah, repeatedly shaving off seconds of uh, starting application servers can be beneficial. Um, but also think of the more flexible scalable scalability you have when your containers um, deploying your app on an application server takes less, less seconds to start. So the, when you are scaling up and down in Kubernetes with containers that need to start these apps, you are more flexible because you the yeah, you do the, you have to do you can uh, you have to wait shorter on when these uh, come up. Also, what is something that is yeah, in my perception not always uh, known to to most developers, if you use a application server for, uh, on a, in a company that has a support contract, often in a support contract. There is a reference or a pointer or a recommendation or even an enforcement of using a specific JVM for getting support on running an application server. So even though an application server should run on every JVM, if you want to make use, use of or want to make as much use as possible from a support contract, you can check if there is a reference to a specific JVM in. So now I've been talking about building, but only, uh, but not only that, also running your app. Now it's time to deploy it, of course, to a scalable environment. And how can you benefit there? Well, we can already start off with the concept of the thin bar again. In this instance, I want to illustrate that I have compiled my app as a thin bar. And you can see and on the Docker layer that I have pushed it to is only 5.65 uh, kilobytes in size. If you would have a Uberjar there with the application server in it, this 79 something megabytes below that might be in the same layer. So when you do a remote push, you are only now pushing five kilobytes instead of like 80. And maybe you have an application server that's even bigger than 80, like 200 or 500 megabytes. You don't have to push those 500 megabytes all the time. So using thin wars is kind of beneficial here if data transfer is a issue or problem for your project. So then a thin bar will help out. I have come to the understanding that you can nowadays use some layering tools to kind of extract the Ubuntu jar that has been pushed to a Docker image layer again to kind of slice the Ubuntu jar and only push what's necessary uh, from that whole archive. It is another layer of complexity in your build, in my opinion. Use it uh, if you think it's necessary. But I think what problem are you trying to solve there? Why not use the Thinbar approach where you separate your business logic and your app from the infrastructure that is your application server? So. So I've been talking about images. That means we are now uh, assuming we are using Docker. And you, you need a Docker image like I just illustrated. And in, in, in the most simple form, um, when you use an Ubuntu jar, you need a Docker image that starts an operating system with Java and then you're kind of done. You can use very small Docker images to just run your app. 
But when you start using an application server, you have to make that part of your Docker image so that you only need to re, uh, uh, re, re to, to repush the, the app to your layer and there, where the application server or the runtime of your choosing is part of the Docker image itself that you push once until it changes with a patch or so. And of course, next to Java and application server, then you also provide your app on it. But this whole package is not only uh, uh, beneficial for local development, but it's also uh, beneficial for shipping the same thing to your operational environment. Uh, for example, your Kubernetes cluster is running. Because just using Docker and not starting your application server from your IDE, for example, when you start using Docker Compose here, you can spin up your app like it should be done in a Kubernetes because yeah, your, your container gets started from, a, from an image. Um, but in this local setup on your development environment, you can the Docker Compose also spin up, for example, a message bus or a database that's part of the uh, infrastructure for your app. And this, using Docker Compose this way kind of simulates how it will run in Kubernetes. It's just not scalable because it's Docker Compose. But when do you really want to start uh, testing scalability of your app locally? I think that's a little bit overkill in most situations. So in my opinion, using Docker Compose to simulate how it runs in, uh, in Kubernetes is enough for local development. But then you can use that image and push it to external uh, repository where it gets picked up by uh, your build pipeline, deploys it to Kubernetes, and you can inject it with the environmental properties there, and it should run in your, in your external uh, environment. And then this is where everything comes together. Kubernetes uses, for example, MicroProfile Health specification to determine the health checks, uh, liveness probes, readiness probes uh, that your uh, apps expose via the MicroProfile Health uh, specification that is being implemented by the uh, application server. Uh, this is one of the cloud native capabilities. Um, you also have, for example, the REST client, a programmatic way of sending inter-service inter uh, HTTP request and also fault tolerance provides retry and fallback uh, mechanisms, for example, um, to, to yeah, um, balance the load between uh, microservices. So in this instance, you can see that we are deploying three different Docker images, with three different uh, yeah, apps, and three different versions of Java and application server. But here you can really use Jakarta E that you have programmed and used for your for your business logic to, to do the, the business stuff and microprofile will take care of everything between it. So th this is where microprofile and Jakarta really come together. Also, the fact that you're using Jakarta your microprofile, Kubernetes doesn't care. He just wants these endpoints to see if the app there is running or not and maybe use microprofile uh, metrics to determine how healthy it is. Uh, based on the metrics, but if there can be even spring running in there or something else, Kubernetes doesn't matter. Uh, it doesn't matter for Kubernetes. But the, 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 the real thing here is this, what's running inside these Docker images in these containers spun up from them, the eff more efficient and more stable, uh, what is running there is beneficial for running it in Kubernetes, of course. So even if you can program your app, app with Jakarta or MicroProfile in a certain way, and you deploy it there, the, developing and deploying it is, in my opinion, not the end of it. As a developer or ops engineer maintaining this in, uh, yeah, like example, for example, in Kubernetes, you also have to, yeah, in my opinion, see how it runs. It is very important, very, very beneficial to make sure it works as good as you uh, program it to be, of course. Then summarizing, um, like I already said a few times, uh, Jakarta E has a feature-rich programming model that you can really 
you know, benefit from as a developer to understand and apply in very different situations. It's not just one thing. It's all over the place nowadays. Uh, in very, uh, spring even borrowing a few specifications from the from the framework. So knowing Jakarta E is not being yeah, old fashioned. It's 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 using a mature programming model for doing cool modern stuff. Uh, if you do it well, and uh, if you are a guy like me that do, does like to do things well, you can kind of tweak your the way you're building it and shipping it, your apps, I mean, of course, um, to, yeah, to, to get a, a, a cadence of, or, of happy developing and happy uh, deploying of your, your app, of course. Yeah, what I also talked about was that uh, uh, a program model uh, supports portability, not only an application server level, because you can switch application servers, but in, to an extent of that also, Java itself, because it runs on Java and JVM is also a specification. So as long as a yeah, JVM implementation like Hotspot or OpenJ9 uh, is compatible with the JVM specification, an application server should be able to run on it. So this, this whole stack, you can pick and match the pieces that you need for your project. Uh, also, like I have shown, it fits in modern scalable environments like Kubernetes because uh, MicroProfile is making care, uh, taking care of these uh, details. And last but not least, the perception that uh, Jakarta E is made for monolithic applications is certainly not true. The way you shape your apps, you define your apps, uh, a monolith, a microservice, a microservice, a nanoservice, it doesn't matter. Jakarta E and MicroProfile don't uh define what you should put in a uh, in a microservice for example or an monolithic application so um, these frameworks don't determine how, how monolithic an application is or not it's just you can build a certain type of application with using jakarta or microprofile specifications as uh, in any way you see fit So to run, uh, wrap up, a few references. You can always look at the Jakarta E website to get more information. There's this compatibility page where you can look for uh, compatible implementations. Uh, and the Eclipse EE4J is the, yeah, the, the root project of the source code of Jakarta E, because Jakarta E is the brand name of all this code in the Eclipse EE4J uh, GitHub repository. Uh, and you can always uh, look there to see if, uh, if you can participate and contribute because we are always looking for new uh, features and new insights in, on how to evolve this framework further. And the same goes for MicroProfile, of course, that you can see on the following links. And if you really want, you can also follow every discussion that's going on on the mailing lists that are mentioned here. So then I would like to thank you for your attention. I hope you learned something. Uh, and again, if you want to reach out to me or discuss anything, uh, please use my Twitter and I will try to get in touch with you as soon as possible. Thank you. Thanks, Edward, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, we'll have a recording of this session available both at this link and uh, on YouTube as well. So enjoy the rest of your days. And if you're joining us from KubeCon, uh, enjoy the rest of that conference as well. Thanks, everybody.